What is this thing here? Huh? Look at this. This is like, this is where I'll be sitting. Here's where you'll be sitting. Fantastic. What a great thing to see that. Have a vision. You know, the Lord has sent me here for an assignment, and isn't that fantastic? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. <laughs> has the Lord ever told you, hey, why don't you do this? And you're like, say again, Lord. <laughs> you, you didn't really mean that, did you? <laughs> You mean it was my fault? Really? You mean I have to repent? No. Yes. I brought notes. Man, I can go for days. <clears throat> we were back here. We were here in February, and, and we did go for days. And, uh, and I, just, I just thank you for that time. That was the first time we had presented uh, Three Degrees Ministries. I've been involved in ministries for, uh, for quite a while now. Uh, 2000, I, well, I brought my, my wife is with me, my beautiful Pam. Maybe she can uh, minister in song here a little bit later. I, I do appreciate uh, Pastor Tommy and Lynette's fellowship and friendship over almost 20 years. Uh, we met in the early 2000s and... You know, uh, Tommy and I were moving, Pastor Tommy and I were working for a moving company. And he was a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger than I was. <laughs> and we had to move this huge television set up four flights of stairs. And we got, we got three floors up and I was on the bottom. And I said, okay, this is not going to work. He's got to get on the bottom because he's bigger than I am. And if it falls on him, it's not going to hurt him as you know, much as it's <laughs> as much as it's going to hurt me. <laughs> so, so I, so I said, "Why don't you get down here and I'll pull and you push," and uh, and he did and we did and and I think that was our bonding moment. <laughs> it was from then on. We were like. We have something to do with one another. <laughs> well, you know, we, uh, Pam and I love them, and, and, I, and I know they love us. And one of, the, one of the reasons in ministry or in anything that you decide to do, why it may not work out, is because you haven't built a team in order to do what you're going to do. Now, I said in the early 2000s, we helped, uh, Pam and I were part of the charter leadership class of Heritage of Faith Christian Center, Brother Jerry's church. We helped launch the church. I was, uh, was going to be in the ushers group because that's where the action was. And, and the Lord told me, uh, you're in the wrong group. And I said, how could I be in the wrong group? This is where the action is and this is where I'm supposed to be. He said, no, you're in the wrong group. You need to go minister to the children. Now, at the time, we had four small children. And I'm like, you know, I don't even like children. And <laughs> I've got some at home, and this is just not, you know, this is not where I want to be. And he says, no, you need to get up. So I, I dismissed myself. I stood up in front of all the, all the ushers with their suits on. And I said, I'm in the wrong meeting. I have to go minister to the children. And uh, knew nothing about children's ministry, but learned how to love people. And the purpose for which I was called was found in ministering to those small children. And it was first through third graders. They, uh, it, it turned out to be you know, fun. I did that for, for two years until the Lord said, go to prison and I couldn't figure out what prison had to do with children. <laughs> he said nothing. <clears throat> but but uh, one of those, what was fun is one of those children 
is a member of the Texas Tech basketball team, and now they're in the Final Four. And that, that, that's kind of neat to, you know, follow his career. He's six foot nine, 270 pounds now. But, you know, back then I could pick him up and move him around. <laughs> but you know what? He didn't make it to the final four by himself. There was a team that was with him. And when we start out to do something, I think we fail to build a team or to build this sufficient network it's going to take in order to accomplish what the Lord is calling us to do. It's almost as if we see this and then we want to step out and start doing it. When there is a huge amount of work that needs to go into character development so that when you get there, you're able to handle it. So if we start, let's turn to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read very familiar verses here. Romans chapter 12. Father God, we just come to you and we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence in our lives and, and what you have done this far. And we expect great things. We expect you to pierce our heart and help us mature and develop in you that, that we come to the fullness of the knowledge and the understanding of what you have for us, that we can be a blessing as well as be blessed in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> what did I say? Romans chapter 12? Well, that's a good place to start. I don't want to be in the Amplified Bible, though. Let's go to the... I love electronic Bibles. Am I doing that? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that must mean I'm hot. <laughs> I know one thing my wife is. She's the reason we don't have a snowblower. When it snows outside, I just say, honey, go walk her out of the park in the driveway. Melt all this stuff. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, very seriously now. <clears throat> Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, which you have done, isn't that fantastic? You've presented your bodies. A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, if we are going to conform to the word of God, have you ever done that? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I know I've done that. And I run out of gas really quick. Because it's based on my good works and my good intentions, what I think I can do. And if I don't get the right adulation, and if I don't get the right recognition, and if someone's not patting me on the back and saying, boy, that was a good job, I'll get upset. Because I learned by ministering to those children, I had an awful director. She was an awful director. And I hope she doesn't hear this, but if she does... <laughs> It's true. Yeah, yeah. She, she was the type of woman that got on my last nerve. And, and then she'd stand on it. And I would come and then dance. But I would come home and I would complain to Pam. I'd be like, Pam, you don't understand. This is horrible. This is hard. I don't, you know, we never, I would get a call. Just, we had 40 children between first and third grade. And I would get a call 15 minutes before service saying, hey, can you handle the children's church at this time? You know, in 15 minutes. I know, that's what I said. Oh, what do we do? And we had puppets and stuff and we were doing everything. And finally I've caught up to me. I'm like, you know what? She's probably going to do this again. So I'm going to prepare myself so that when she does call me, we're set. And, and I had my little ace in the hole. I was like walking like I was packing. You know, I, I'm ready. I'm ready. Jump. You know, leapfrog. You know, put frog landing zone on my chest. You feeling froggy, jump up here and get some because I am ready. <clears throat> so when she would call, I'd be like, yeah, I can do children's church. But it would, it would get on my nerves because it wasn't the way it was supposed to go. 
It, it wasn't, we were Christians. We were supposed to be doing things right. We're supposed to love one another. Everything is supposed to work out right. And it, and it wasn't working. Yeah. And, and many other people came through the children's department and they quit. Yeah. I'm like, why don't I get to quit too? I would like to quit. Let me go back to the ushers where we can have some action. I'll just catch people as they come, as they fall down. Brother Jerry will come upon because that was the that was the thing. Everybody was falling out at the time. <laughs> then we learned it wasn't spiritual to fall out all the time. So now we're all standing up, and we, but sometimes we would fall. But it wasn't going like it was supposed to. And he asked me this very important question. You might even want to write it down. Why is it that you're doing this? What are you doing here? What is the purpose? Are you here for me or are you here to get along with someone else? And I had to learn very quickly. I was there for those children. And I was going to be there and minister to those children. If nobody else ministered to the children, this is what we're going to do. Because that's my assignment, that's what the Lord said do, and that's what I'm going to be responsible and answerable to. She's not going to have to answer to this. I'm supposed to minister to these kids, and I did. That was one of the, I was even, and there was a, uh, I was making copies one day for the children's lesson, and I was in the, the, the main office at Jerry Savelle Ministries, and, and I'm the director at the time I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm making copies. I was in the ministry. I got to make copies. It was exciting. He says, what are you doing? I said, making copies. He says, oh, fun, huh? And I'm like, remember, I'm packing. What do you mean? He's like, no, that's not a very important thing to do. I said, you don't understand. I get to do this. I get to be a part of these kids' lives. This is what I get to do. This is my assignment. I don't have but one assignment, and I get to make copies, and this is it. And, brother, I made copies. They probably had to order more paper after all, all the copies I made. But everybody had a copy of their lesson and an extra one because that was my assignment. Well, what's your assignment? See, God doesn't care... God wants to understand or God wants to hear your faithfulness before he can trust you. He wants to trust you. He wants you to grow up to the full stature of Christ. But if you cannot be trusted with the little things, which are little kids, how can you be trusted? I'm not plugging for the children's ministry. I'm just saying that's where we started. <laughs> If you can't be trusted with the little kids, how can you be trusted with something that's very important? How can you be trusted with more? Unless you're faithful with what belongs to somebody else, unless you get on a team and get with somebody else and start doing something with them, who's going to give you your own team? You can't do something unless you've been helping someone else. So you want to you wanna grow? God's going to move at the speed of productive relationships. So if you want to grow, you find out what God's already doing and get involved in that. <clears throat> and so after Bible school, we went home to, uh, from Fort Worth, Texas to Wisconsin. This is, and uh, we tried to join a church. We tried to, I tried to get involved in at the time, I was doing jail and prison ministry, and we tried to get involved. We got involved there, and I was going into the jail. First time I went into the jail, 17 dudes got saved. Yeah. We're like, we're on to something. And we kept going, and we had a purpose. And I knew a year before, because the Lord would tell you what you're supposed to do. You just got to listen to him. You knew a year before, so I prayed about going to this county jail. I said, I can't wait to get into that county jail. It just happened to be the place where we both grew up in the same county. 17 guys got saved, and then a few months went by, and we decided, you know what? These guys need a place to go to church because they would get out of jail, and then they go hook up with who they used to hook up with, and then they do some more do some more dope, and then they'd come back to jail again, and I'd get to see them, and it'd be like having a captive audience when they're in church, but we'd like to let them go home and come back. 
And so in October of 2003, the Lord put it on both Pam and I's heart to start New Wine Church. And so we started in our living room. Actually, we started in our kitchen table. And a few people came over. And then that went a couple of months. And then I thought, well, if we're going to, we're going to get bigger. We're going to have to have a place to meet. And it was all because of our strength of purpose, which was ministering. What happened is that we started ministry to the unchurched people. The people that never been to church, that was our, that was our people. And so I went out and rented for $500 a month. I rented a room. I said, Pam, I rented a room. <laughs> she says, how much is that? I said, it's $500 a month. She said, where are we going to get $500? I said, I don't know. <clears throat> but the Lord will provide it. And, and he did. Unless we do step out in faith, the Lord has nothing to work with. We need to be willing to risk And walk by faith, not by sight. And within a year, we had our own church building. Now, it was one of those Lutheran churches, you know, with the big steeple and uh, the red carpet and the little blue basement, you know. We were, in, we were in our own church building within a year. And we started to grow. And we would get up to 80. And we, we were in a town of 800 people. And we get up to like 80, pe uh, 80 people in a Sunday service, which for the area was about, about right. I mean, you're, you're not going to be in a town of 800 people and have 1,000 people coming to church because that's weird. <clears throat> We'd have to build a fence around it and say it's a compound or something. Anyway, <sighs> but we grew and, and things were good. And what happened was the other people that were competent in the area saw our mission. This is what the Lord wants us to do. This is, they, they, they were about the same, they spoke the same language and they were about that same mission and they wanted to, someone asked me when he, we were here in, uh, in February, how do you find good people? It becomes on your strength of vision. You find good people on your strength and your vision of what you're setting out to do. Because there are others that have that same mission or same vision. And as you are working together, you start to build relationships. And over time, those relationships, they're like, well, why should we go to this church? Because this is our vision. This is what we want to do too. And so they joined our church and, and that's how we grew. But there was a problem. Is I didn't have the character or the development to handle what was happening. And so we've started Three Degrees Ministries, and this is a big reason why, is because in the beginning, everything looked great. People were coming to church, but you know, people bring problems to church. People have agendas and ideas and how things should be done. And, and if you're does, not done that way, well, sometimes they leave. <clears throat> but so in the beginning, it starts out right. But if you're just three degrees off, eventually you're going to end up somewhere you never intended to be. And so we need a team that will help us make all these corrections this is why the Bible says people that love correction are smart because it's true. It's a good book. That's what it says. And we keep making these corrections on the way to a destination. And the leader's job is to set the course of the destination. This is where we're going. Now, if I'm looking straight out and what's supposed to happen if we get off course if I see anything over here, then I'm going to know that's not right. And we need to bring it back in line. And so the leader's job, whether you're leading the children's ministry, whether you're leading the ushers, whether you're leading the whole church, 
The leader's job is to set that course. The team's job is to provide, you could say, the propulsion in order to get it done. So it's not his job to do everything. It's his job to make sure everything gets done. It's his job to make sure that we are going to reach our destination. That this is, this is why we were sent. So when we started New Wine Church, our destination was to minister to the unchurched people, which there happened to be all kinds of them. And so there was no shortage of people. They come from everywhere. We had more felonies than anything in there. I mean, we would scare people. <clears throat> the normal people would try and come and we'd scare them off. We, you know, I've heard people complain about growing a church and how hard it is. And their area is the hardest one. Like, we had a sex offender living in our church building. They grow a church there. <laughs> I mean, we don't get to complain that it's difficult. Of course it is. <laughs> That's why you don't, you're not close enough to the Lord to know that he's already given you the power to overcome that. If you want to pay more attention to your distraction than what the Lord's told you to do, knock yourself out. But he's not interested in it as hard. You think he's surprised? Oh, they're hard. He's not surprised. It's supposed to be. The only reason that we criticize others, we condemn others, or we complain about things is because we are not close enough to the Lord. That's it. Because the Lord knows where you're at. And if he doesn't know where you're at, you better let him know. <laughs> he knows where you are. He knows what's going on. If someone's getting on your nerve, he knows. He knows what they're like when they go home. <laughs> <laughs> My Bible just shut off. <clears throat> it's like I give up. So we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't get the right to criticize, to condemn, to complain. We get the right to worship God and know that He has sent us here for a purpose in this calling. And He has sent us here because good people are going to show up in order to accomplish this vision because this vision is not mine, it's His. Amen. Now, when you can say that, you can rest. But if it's your vision and it's, we're going to do this, well, that's a horse of a different color. You can work hard and let the Holy Spirit rest. Or you can allow the Holy Spirit to work hard and you rest. We labor to enter rest. We labor to enter his rest. And so when we have the thought, oh, this is difficult. Oh, this is, that is the point where we labor to enter his rest. We know that this is difficult. However, Lord, you have not brought us this far to let us fall. So <clears throat> we are going to see this through. Amen. You will come through. I walk by faith and not by sight. And I can't wait to see how you make this come to pass. Amen. Because it doesn't look good from here. <laughs> so, so what finally happened here with New Wine Church, we were growing and things were good, but it outgrew my understanding. And, and I searched for people to mentor me. And I tried to understand leadership, but it was to no avail. It's almost like it was too late. And so it fell apart. We went from 80 on a regular service, plenty of money coming in, to 20 or less. And then people would say stuff about us that wasn't true. And they were Christians. It was horrible. It was gut-wrenching, if you can say that in church. It was, it was a horrible experience. It tore us up. And so the Lord sent me back to work. And he, he found, you know, he still knows where you are even when your guts are being ripped out. And he sent me to work with a Christian car dealer. 
and I started to sell cars. And for three years, I sold cars. And our, our whole life started to stabilize because you get too far into ministry and sometimes you can get unstable. And our life stabilized and things were pretty good and, and we had money again and, and we were smiling at one another. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, it, and it was okay. And I would have, I would have been just content to, to keep it that way. What happened was we merged with the Assembly of God Church in town. The assembly people kind of took over the running of the church and I'd minister every couple of weeks but they did the heavy lifting and, and we, were, we, were, we were good. The Lord knows where we're at. Amen. That went on three years and then the Lord said, you know what, I would rather, I would like you to go back to work. I said, what does that mean? He says, go to Cambridge. Cambridge, Minnesota is a town 35 miles from where we live. He says, go to Cambridge. <coughs> and I knew of a recovery ministry in Cambridge but thought it was fine and didn't think anything of it. Have you ever had the Lord tell you to do something and you blow him off? And you just wait. You're like, maybe you'll forget about that. <laughs> I'm busy right now. <laughs> I'm living here. But, but actually it worked out to where uh, I was laid off. They sold the company, the car company, and I was laid off. And finally, after a couple of months, I was obedient. And I went up to Cambridge and drove up, parked. And uh, I, I didn't even know where the place was. I had to Google where it was. And parked, and a woman was coming across the, the yard. And I got out of my car, and I said, hey, what's going on? They said, oh, we need a preacher and a teacher. I think I can help. And so she's like, she was pretty skeptical, but she brought me inside and in the uh, in the church, and <clears throat> there was eight guys laying on couches, literally like laying on couches watching a video. That was their curriculum. And and I stood it up and I started talking to them. And five minutes, she stopped me. She goes, "Okay, that's enough." Can, can you come back, you know, so-and-so. And I met with the previous pastor, and he's like, yeah, you know, the, I've got to take care of some things, and it'll just be like three months, and then you can, you know, you can go on your way, but just help me out. I'm like, three months, I can do that. I can, I can, well, it's been five years now. <laughs> 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 it's been five years. Um, what, what he didn't tell me was that he was having inappropriate relations with the clients. At the, uh, it's a recovery home. We have three homes. We can house 24 people, uh, one house for women, up to nine women, sometimes 10 if they're desperate, and uh, about 15 guys, and we help them recover their lives and get them back to work and back on their feet. And, the, and that's the ministry. But he was having relations with some of the women. And then he, they had embezzled. Isn't that what you call it when you inappropriately spend money? <laughs> they, had, uh, <coughs> they, they had misappropriated a whole lot of money, like $80,000. And owed the county money, uh, owed several counties money, owed the IRS money, and the Lord was saying, you know, when you want a ministry opportunity, this is not what, you know, you're usually looking for. So let's find something with a horrible reputation and deep in debt. <clears throat> I, t I talked, to, uh, talked to a friend of mine, and he's a businessman. He's like, I think the Lord's in this. I think you should do it. I'm like, Really? I went and talked to the, uh, one of the, the local pastors who kind of knew what was going on in the recovery scene, and, and he kind of opened my eyes to what was happening. And, and nobody would touch this stuff with a 10-foot pole. It is not, it, it would have been 10 times easier to shut down the ministry 
walk away from the debt and start something brand new. We didn't create the debt. I didn't sleep with anybody else. I didn't, I didn't misuse money. My wife's like, you better not. I didn't create it, but it was created in the name of the Lord. Now, if we walk away, we're going to make him look bad. So I said, and a couple of other people said, we have a team. We'll do this. In fact, that, that minister, the, uh, the, the, uh, like a ministry association got together and they brought Pam and me over, mostly me, <clears throat> to, to their house and they're trying to tell us to shut this thing down because it's, uh, it's an abomination, really. It was. It was an abomination to the community. It was, it was there was really nothing godly happening and, and they just wanted to shoot it. And I had to tell them, I'm not even Catholic. I had to tell them, the Lord didn't bring me here to fail. And so, if you're not going to help me, hide and watch. And I, I was mentioned just a, just a little bit ago, I was mentioned to Pam, it was like, three or four months ago, I'm like, yeah, it took him a long time for them to warm up to me in that community, you know, as part of a minister. He's, she said, well, you did tell him to hide and watch. <clears throat> but I heard Jerry Savelle say that, and I thought, yeah, hide and watch. This is, see, I had already been through a battle with New Wine Church. I had already fought this fight. I had already seen this game before. So walking into this was, was nothing. Walking into this was, okay, this is a chance where I get to prove or demonstrate the will of God. So the first couple years, it was hard. The first couple years, they called us names. The first couple years, nobody wanted anything to do with us. But one Baptist man came and started helping me. I, we, I would teach 9 to noon, Tuesday through Friday. I taught every class all the time because we were an abomination, the ministry was. But this guy, he says, like, I think you're all right. The Lord's led me here. And he started helping. Then another person started helping. And we, over about three and a half years, changed the perception of the community. When other people, listen, when others felt safe about what we were doing, they wanted to get on board. And so then they started getting on board. And then the reputation started to change. And then a year and a half ago, we paid back all the money. One of our landlords, we were over $10,000 in debt just to the one landlord. But we paid back all the money. Amen. See, we can stand. Amen. I'm not moved by man. Yes. I'm not moved by what someone's going to tell me. I'm not moved by a mountain of debt. I'm not moved by a bad reputation. I'm moved by what I believe. I show up in a dark place and the dark place changes. Because of the Holy Spirit working through us, through our team, <clears throat> we transformed this community. Every single, when I got there, every single person was using drugs. They would take the ministry van. This is true. I don't care if you believe it or not. They would take our ministry van. Hide and watch. They would take our ministry van down to Minneapolis, get drugs and bring them back and be doing dope and then come to class the next day. Every one. I mean, not like one of them. Now it's, it's like, what? now if you do that, you know, we, we take care of you. But. So we not only had to change the outside perception, we had to change the inside perception. We had to uphold God's righteous standard. That's our job as Christians. Uphold God's righteous standard for what's happening. What does that mean? That doesn't mean enabling. 
But it does mean giving grace. So if someone relapses or uses drugs, we don't necessarily kick them out for the same reason they came in the first place. Is their attitude, do they have a repentant attitude? Are they, are they wanting to change? If they don't want to change, if someone is not, listen, if someone is not willing to face reality, they can't change. They cannot grow. And sometimes the reality is, and, and I help them with this, and I say, you were a horrible, horrible mother. You were a horrible father. That is not right. It's not condemning. It is the truth. And until we come to the realization of the truth, see, we want to renew our mind. And that implies it is not renewed. And there's things it needs to be renewed from. And self-deception is one of those things. When I first started becoming uh, really serious with God, I believed I was cursed. I grew up in addiction. My dad was a drug addict, alcoholic. My mother abused drugs, alcohol. Uh, my other side of the family, they were very poor. And so I believe growing up, because sometimes you'll believe things because of what others have put in you, not necessarily who, that's who you are. And so if you don't see another way out, you'll take that on as truth. So if you have a father with an anger problem, he always has an anger problem, and he demonstrates or models anger to you, that's what you'll say, well, this is the way we do, and we act angry. Whatever the modeling is that we see most often is the modeling we're going to present because we don't know any better. So I thought I was poor. I thought I was poor. I thought I was cursed. I was always going to be that way. You ever know those people that were they just about to get to succeed and then something happens and they drop back? And it just happens over and over again? What is going on there? They've had modeling and there's a story that's being told. And every time you get to the ceiling, your self-limiting beliefs, limiting beliefs push you back down. And that's self-deception. Does this make sense? Yeah. You get so far and then you say, oh, that's it. And, and it's much easier. I'm helping somebody. It's much easier to say, I'm black. That's why I didn't get the opportunity. Than it is to say, I'm a child of God. I don't care what color I am. That has nothing to do with it. I have a covenant with Almighty God, and if he has to build an entire plant here just so I can have a job, that's what's going to happen. I know him in whom I have believed, and I know I have opportunity. But opportunity, like I said, with River City Recovery Ministries, it's a recovery ministry, it may come dressed as a pig. <laughs> <laughs> you got to put a lot of lipstick on it to change it. <laughs> it may come dressed as work. We want our opportunities to come looking like opportunities. Right? <laughs> it's supposed to be, you know, we, we want the prettiest girl for the prom date. I mean, it's, she's supposed to be all done up by the time she reaches us. <clears throat> That's not what happens. <laughs> Shut off again. This thing's got to stay on. Every single person that's on our staff at River City, I've had to train them. One, uh, one girl is a couple years sober. She's on our staff. She has a paid position. And she deals with mostly the women. But she used to use heroin. She used heroin in our program. And, but she had to come to a, a point of honesty where I can't do this. She had a young child. Now she's married. Uh, has, a, has another little baby. And they're doing very well. But we had to train her. 
The other woman that's on our staff had a 20 year using drug career, at least 20 years. Nuttier than a fruitcake when she came. Thought everything was funny. <clears throat> Sometimes people will use humor as a defense. Sometimes people you will use aggression as a defense so that you don't get to know them. And, and she, that's what she would do. She would be lash, not lashing out, but like, hey, how are you? You know, and if I can just put everything on you, then I don't have to be accountable. Well, that wasn't going to work. So like 20 months later, she is a part of our staff and she's the admissions director. She talks to people. She thought she had to go to school and everything. And I'm like, look, you can spot stuff. When someone calls and wants to come into our program, you have enough understanding of what they're going to say to sort through the, what do you call it, minutia? What's the good? The baloney stuff. You can sort through the, <laughs> there's another word that starts with B. <laughs> <laughs> but the baloney stuff works good. <laughs> if you get nothing out of the whole day, baloney stuff. <laughs> but she can sort through the baloney stuff. And, uh, and she's a great admissions director. Our, our having to kick people out because they don't want to be a part of the program is greatly reduced since she's doing the interviews. <clears throat> but our whole team, I had to, I, I had to train them. Okay. Well, the, the first guy that started working with me, he he was, he had a retired. He retired from a, a thirty-year seed business, and he's about sixty, and he's sixty-four now. So that's when he's when he came, but he wasn't experienced at all with addiction or with the ridiculous things that we sometimes go through. And so you don't, it's, God qualifies the call, right? Yeah. But one day he got a call from one of our clients that said, I'm about to be arrested. Could you come get me? Either you come get me or I'm going to be arrested. So if you know that sometimes people being arrested is not a bad thing. Anyway, I really feel led to tell the story. It's kind of ridiculous. But <clears throat> he says, okay, you know, it's the middle of the night, obviously. And he comes and he, he brings a guy. He brings a guy home to, uh, to one of our houses. Then two hours later, that same individual that he just picked up, was dancing topless, it's a guy, dancing topless in front of the women's house. <laughs> Loren says, I should have let him get arrested. There are some, I know, right? You're looking at me like, come on. Did he just say, yes. Just a couple of months ago, we had a guy that was, that was on some medication and um, probably a little too much medication and he borrowed our ministry van and ended up a hundred miles off course and crashed it. <clears throat> yeah, he was off more than three degrees. He, he crashed, the, crashed the ministry van and it's totaled and I made him sit six hours and a hundred miles away before we go up and get him. See, sometimes we have to deal with mental illness and that's a that's a completely different animal yeah. with addiction. Yeah. And we didn't kick him out. We didn't treat him any differently. We serve God. Yeah. We're not treating people how they treat us. Yeah. We treat people how God wants them to treat. Oh, wow. We uphold God's righteous standard. Yeah. So he was obviously embarrassed of what happened and he appreciated the grace and you know what a couple of weeks later he had a quite a transformation to where now he's going to be able to move on and live without this this mess that was going on in his mind 
we're here to uphold God's righteous standard, to demonstrate, to prove what is the acceptable, perfect will of God. That's what you're sent to do out into the world. So what is your purpose? What has God called you to do? See, the way this church grows is you. What is your strength of purpose? Who are you involved with? Who are you helping? We are blessed to be a blessing. It's not what someone can give to you, but how much can you give? As you're giving, the Lord meets your needs. He meets your wants. As you're giving. If you're tight, you've not given the Lord anything to work with. So today, River City Recovery Ministries is, is, is well. It's healthy. It's, we, we still have ridiculous things happen because that's who we invite into our lives. But we, we, we uphold this standard so then they transform. They don't conform. We don't make them do anything. I have two rules. Don't sleep with one another and don't use drugs or alcohol. That's my rules. If you can do that, I think we can get through everything else. Amen. And there's others that come in and say, well, you know, there should be more rules. You enforce them. <laughs> How are you going to make somebody not think? You can't. God doesn't do us that way. He allows you to do and think with exactly what you want to think. It is because of our relationship with him that we don't think ridiculous things. <clears throat> oh, let me get back to this about the, uh, I used to believe I was cursed. And what happened to break that is I cast it down. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, is, is where you find that. I was coming up to a stoplight but just before the Christian bookstore, just coming up to the light, just turned red. And I'm coming up to the, to the light and I'm looking myself in the rear view mirror. And I said, you are not cursed. You are not cursed. And I do this all the time. I mean, because I really believed it. See, you can want something different. But if you really believe in your heart that you are a certain way, it doesn't matter what you're saying with your head. What matters is what's in your heart. And it's by casting down those arguments and high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, that's what breaks your heart. That's what breaks that stronghold. And so by taking the thought, I said, you are not cursed. And I was yelling. I mean, if you just saw me, you thought I was a lunatic. I was yelling at myself, you are not cursed. And it, and it went, it's like it broke. One, one, one minute, I'm cursed. The next minute, no more curse. Amen. And I'm like, wow. And it just felt like a weight fell off. Was everything perfect and right? No, things were really quite challenging. But I was no longer cursed. I had the opportunity. I could do something now where I believed I couldn't do it before. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so... This has been almost a 20-year journey of getting to the point where we launched Three Degrees is I've been through these battles. I understand what it's like to reach out and in Christianity not have modeling or mentoring because we're too busy on our own stuff. God really works in small teams. If you get too many people involved, then the trust factor goes out the window. So if you have a group of 10 people, the depth of your relationship is not going to be as deep as if you have five or six. It's just the way it is. And so this is what happens in these teams that you build teams is that as you're working on God's business, 
He is building each person up. As Nehemiah worked on the wall, he built the people as they built the kingdom. This is, this is, the, this is the way the church works. As you are building God's kingdom, God is going to perfect and develop your character so that down the road, you're able to affect and model someone else. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2, look at that. <clears throat> Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2. God thinks generationally. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. In these things, well, I'll start at verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong, this is Paul talking to Timothy, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you now heard from me among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will also who will be able to teach others also. This is a picture of how modeling and how the, the biggest thing we do at Recovery, uh, River City Recovery is model Christianity. And it's normally not when things are good. It's when things go awry. How do you handle life when things is, are stirred up? Can you maintain your composure? Can you maintain your attitude? Can you maintain yourself when things are bad? Or oh, there's oppression? Or when there's, you know, when it's tense? Can you, can you stand? Can you stay? Can you live by what you believe? Or are you going to be moved by what someone says? And so what Paul is saying here, what you've seen in me, you do this. But not only this, this is where I, I, I have an issue with someone that talks about you, read my book and then you'll be good. Just read my book and then you'll be okay. Not far enough. Read my book on how to teach someone else this. How do you disciple? How does it go beyond you? How do, who is the faithful man you're discipling? Who are the others that you come in contact with that you're discipling? Who are they? I guarantee you, you're in contact with somebody. <clears throat> it's not enough. See, you really want to grow the church? Get more people teaching. Yeah. The more teaching happening, the faster you're going to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is something that happens when you have, when you go up and and we're, we're in communication with one another, and I have to look in your eye, and you have to look in my eye, and then we make this connection. Sorry, didn't mean to hit you so hard. <laughs> and we make this connection. You know what he's thinking? He's thinking, are you full of baloney? That's right, that's the word, right? Are you full of baloney? Or can I trust you? That's what the world is looking for. They're looking for someone, can I trust you? Are you going to be there when I'm hurt? Yeah. Well, are you going to come to my house and give me chicken soup when I'm sick? Yeah. Are you going to judge me when I make a mistake? Yeah. There is just something looking eyeball to eyeball yeah. that you cannot do over the Internet, yeah. that you can't do over a book, or you can't do over lectures. Right. You are the church. You are the body. You are the ecclesia. You are the called out ones. That's what you're called out for, so that you're stable, so you know, I know how to fight. I know how to fight, Christian fight. I'm, I'm, I'm good at that now, because I've been, I've gotten whooped. I've been whooped. I'm whoop, no whooping no more. Anyone's bringing a can, I'm bringing the can. I don't believe that. You just hide and watch, because that's what's going to happen. This is, this, is what, this is what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to, to look one another in the eye. You know what? When you, can, when you can do that, when you can hold someone accountable, 
and you can hold one another. Doesn't the Bible say submit therefore one to another? And when we submit one to another, when, when we make a mistake or when we're off track a little bit, like three degrees, when we're off track and I submit to you and I say, you know what? I got off track here. I missed this. And then you can feed, give me feedback and, and help me be back on track. Guess what? Know who he can trust the next time he gets off track. And nobody got it all together. Nobody. Nobody got it all together. Yeah. It's just, they, they, no, they, nobody got it all together. Because once we reach one level, there's still another one to go. Once you reach another level, there's still another one to go. Until you see, oh, Jesus Christ, there you are. You know, till that day, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're feeling good about yourself. You think you got this, go fill up your bathtub. <laughs> It only needs to be about that full. Step in. You see if you, you know, if you're on top of the water, you, you're, you made it. <laughs> Till then. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of distractions that come your way. A lot of distractions that will say, that will call themselves more important than what the Lord has called you to do. It's important to identify what things you need to handle and take care of and the things you need to let go that are just distractions. If you're coming down the, down the interstate, you don't have to take every exit. This is an exit. We'll just let that go by. There's some things you don't have to answer. Don't, pay, don't give a distraction any attention. If it if it's, has to do with where you're going, then handle it. If not, it's a distraction. It's meant to... There are people that can live years in distraction. And, and a lot of times, it's their story. It's how you grew up or it's what somebody did to you. You know what? A lot of people have done some ugly things to a lot of people and that's what happens. That's what happens. Now God is, you know, your problem is real big and your God's real small or God's real big and your problem's real small. And it's the size of your God determines your distraction or your story. If the first thing out of your mouth is, I could, but, well, you got a story. Get rid of that story. It is a distraction. And, and you know, sometimes if someone was hurt 20 years ago, you know, they want to keep showing people, look, this is where I was hurt 20 years ago. Get over it. But it hurt. Yes, it did. And it was wrong. But probably you might have had something to do with it. <laughs> no upset about that. <laughs> covered that one, covered that one, covered that one. Ah, here's a good one. Um, we need to grow in depth before we grow in breadth. It's easier to grow in breadth because we don't have to go very deep. But if we're going to master something, here, listen close. This has to do with building teams. If we're going to master something, it's probably going to take about 10,000 hours to master it. Now, there ain't nobody got that much time to master everything. So, uh, you know, many, many of you have met my partner, uh, Pastor Steve Winters. He is a master at money. He is. He's a master at money. Amen. He's, he's just ridiculous. I marvel at him. You know, he's a knucklehead when it comes from other things, but money. Are you taping this morning? Hi, Steve. Hopefully he quit early. 
Well, there's some conversations we've been, I can't tell you. Anyway, he's a master of money, but he's put all the time into it, right? And so when it comes to fighting and leadership and building teams and interpersonal communications, I put a lot of time in that. I mean, I own the space. I own the space that I walk in. And so I have an anointing or a, a God-given grace and ability to help others do that. That's what three degrees is about, is about to bring the ministry gifts together because we are a body, bring the ministry gifts together where one's develop and empower or infuse that into other bodies. Does that make sense? It is the body working together. There's no greater success that I'm ever going to have than to see your success here. There's no, I want to be on the ride. Hopefully you want to be on the ride. I want to see this come to pass. And I'm going to commit myself to do everything I can to help you make this come to pass. This is, that's exciting. You know who these people are? Who are all these people that sit in these little seats? Who are they? They're, they're going to come here because you did, because you're here. Right? I mean, you probably got some bikers. You probably got some doctors. You probably got some <clears throat> moms. That's, well, you got moms and dads. That's for sure. But who are they? How exciting. It's going to be, they're going to come as a result of your ministry. As a result of your vision and purpose. As a result of you transforming this corridor, that's where they're coming from. Isn't that fantastic? Yes. They, others have God's life breathe through them. How fantastic. What an opportunity. I mean, this is a great place to be. I don't know if you know it, but this is a really great place to be. I mean, we came down here, we're like, man, this is a great place to be. It's, it's so, uh, it's such a great place to be. <laughs> what I've been talking about for the last hour is limiting beliefs. And let's just take a moment 